Let me take you back to the 1970s. A decade of confrontation, crisis and social change. But if you were a teenager like I was then, life boiled down to one simple question. Were you a David Cassidy fan or were you a Donny Osmond fan? I was a Donny Dolly. The Osmonds were back in town and the fans knew all about it. Hello. The Osmonds? Yes, I know. I'm staying here. Wherever they went, the fans would be waiting. Meanwhile, lining up outside our language lab at school, I remember very clearly arguing with my friend about who was the best. Was it David Cassidy? Or was it Donny Osmond? Both names, of course, were carved into the soundproof booths with one arm of a compass. But if only we could see our idol in the flesh. It's so good to see you too. I'm bringing you back in time. I know, this is just so surreal. This is the actual window. This is the place. I'm standing right there, Fern. Waving it out. All those fans out there just screaming. Such a great time in my life. Donny Osmond was pushed in front of the camera, aged five. Don't you cry. You get out there and do it. As the biggest teen idol on the planet, he sang to hysterical love-struck girls. Crawling over cars, pulling off windscreen wipers, they were rocking the coach. It was, it was absolutely terrifying. But the teeny boppers grew up. And Donny spent 10 years in the musical wilderness. The teen thing is a very narrow window. It's the next one and then the next one. My past has no relevance to what I'm doing right now. It's going to be difficult? Mm. I don't think so. There were times where I, I felt like, you know, back off, leave him alone. He won back fans against the odds, but battled for years to escape his childhood demons. I hit it well, but I was dying inside. <sighs> Throughout, he stuck to his Mormon faith, though at times he doubted. I remember looking at myself in the mirror. I said, you are such a hypocrite. It's me too. But this year, he's celebrating 50 years in show business. Many times I've been alone. And I wonder how he now views those years as the most famous teenager in the world, and how he not only survived, but has grown to embrace his past, present, and future. You just released your 60th album. Can you believe that? It's personal and it's nostalgic and it's sentimental. And it's all of those and more. Yeah? Because it's my life. That's why I called it the soundtrack of my life. Um, every song has a significant story. For instance, My Sherry Amore was the first 45 I ever bought. And it's the first track on the album, isn't first it? First track on the album. It leads it all go. off. I think we need to go and sit down and have Let's a chat. Let's go sit down. Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> Donald Clark Osmond was born on the 9th of December 1957 in Ogden, Utah. The seventh child of devout Mormons, Olive and George Osmond. Donny, tell me about your parents, because obviously they are the vital bedrock of what became the phenomenon called the, the Osmonds. Yes, yeah. they loved each other. Yeah. I never heard my, my parents fight, ever. I never heard my father raise his voice to my mother. I'm sure they you know, disagreed every once in a while, everybody does, but it wasn't apparent to me mm. uh, growing up as a child. So uh, they loved each other, and more than love, they respected each other. They, they were such a great example mm. uh, to me as to what a relationship really should be like. They both had very different backgrounds, didn't they? Yes, they did have uh, very different backgrounds. My mother had a very stable home life, whereas my father didn't. Mm. He was uh, kind of kicked out as a kid. He lost his dad uh, when he was three months old. Mm. Uh, his dad was killed. Went into the army. Look what he did, Fern. Here's a man who had nothing, nothing, 
to his life, to his name. He had no money. Yet the world knows the name Osmond. You got to give the man some respect. <laughs> My dad was a very strong Christian man that wanted his children to be raised uh, really loving God and giving back to other people. He wanted them to have ethics and honesty and integrity. He was very, very adamant that we stayed close as a family and that we went to church and that we, you know, he, want, he was a great dad. He didn't spare the spankings, did he? No, 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 I got spanked. Yeah. Yeah. Did you cry? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Was it fair? Well, it was the only way to... It, it was the norm back in those days. Yeah. He was an army sergeant. My mom had such a soft hand. Yeah. So they complimented each other very well. And I'm not saying my dad didn't have a soft hand. I mean, he loved me. I know he loved me. He expressed it. Even to the day he died, he loved me. Mm -hmm. And but, and I think he regretted some of the, the hard discipline. Uh, so, you know, he did the best he could. He, he, he didn't like any of you crying, did he? Oh, no. No. Don't you cry. Don't show your emotion. When you've got a job to do, you get out there and do it. I know I'm painting a very, very, you know, ugly picture, and, and some people watching right now think, what an abusive father. But isn't it interesting that I love him, you know, that I respect him? I can hardly wait to see him again. So you believe in life after death? I do. I will be able to be with my parents again someday. That's a comfort, isn't it? It is. Mm. There's hope. Without hope, uh, you don't really have a lot to hold on to. You just live for the moment. You know, it's like, then what? You know, but th there's so much more to, to life than just this existence. You know, there's, there's eternity. Donnie's faith has been a constant throughout his life. Well, I'm going back to you, he was brought up a member of the Church of the Latter-day Saints in a state where over half the population is Mormon. And his devout parents instilled strong religious values into their children. God is just to everyone. In the world to come, rewards will be as varied as the kind of lives we lead here on Earth. One of my great memories was going to Utah and staying with them. And here I am talking to a bunch of beautiful Mormons who, you know, believe in God, uh, don't not only drink alcohol or smoke, they don't even drink caffeine. Uh, coffee, Coca-Cola, any of those drinks, no way, Jose. And I was just completely seduced by the purity of these people. But though Mormonism has 12 million members worldwide, its beliefs aren't widely understood. I've heard that you're a Mormon. Mm -hmm. how, what does that mean and how does that affect your life as a pop singer? I think sometimes Mormons have a, a wrong connotation of being a strange, even a cult type religion, but it, we're not. Oh, sing, can you see? The Church of the Latter-day Saints was founded by a 19th century American, Joseph Smith, who Mormons believe received a divine revelation which became the Book of Mormon. The Bible is also central to Mormonism, but some traditionalists believe Mormons cannot claim to be Christian because of fundamental differences, such as their belief that God is a physical being and that all humans have the potential to be godlike. I always love it when people say, you know, what's the difference between Mormons and Christians? <laughs> because the name of the church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. So we are definitely Christians. We follow the Bible, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God. Mm -hmm. We follow the King James Version. And everybody thinks the Book of Mormon replaces the, the Bible. It doesn't. It's just another testament that Jesus is the Christ. And it's a, uh, it's a historical book of what took place in the American continent. We say that the Book of Mormon is an account of when Christ visited the American continent. That's really all it is. So he came to America? Yeah, that's what we believe. Really? It's an account of the generations of, of the people who existed uh, at that time. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, that, that, that's all it is. Because there's a lot of misconceptions and, and bad propaganda out there about what, what we believe. I don't know why. Mm. So you're not polygamous, you're not all of those No, I've got things. 17 wives, but that's, that's besides the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until a hundred years ago, some Mormons practiced polygamy, the taking of more than one wife. Today, it's outlawed by the church. 
But something that hasn't changed is the emphasis on family and the importance of children, which is why Mormons often have large families. Your parents had nine children. Mm -hmm. You're number seven. Yes. Lucky number seven. Uh, what was home life like for you? Busy? Very busy. Yeah. Very, very busy, Fern. Um, we slept in army bunks. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing we could afford. <laughs> it was quite, quite funny as I look back now, but uh, Marie had her own room. You know, she was the only girl, and it's like, this isn't fair. <laughs> I'm sleeping in army bunks, and she's got this really nice bedroom. That's not absolute truth. I didn't have my own room until I was 11. And also, he forgets that my room was always the guest room. So when company came, they stayed in Marie's room, and Marie got the couch. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was the way we did it. It was the only way we could do it, because we didn't really have a lot of money. You have found for us some footage of you all, and you as a little boy, that no one has seen before. No one has ever seen this. You know, we're on our, in our little top hats, we got canes, Alan's on a, on a stand-up bass, <laughs> and they pan across, and finally you get to me. And I'm, <laughs> and I, I don't remember seeing this footage before, I just found it. Look at them yeah. all. Look That's at before you. Before it all. Took happy off. memories. Yes. Very happy memories. Yeah. And then the work started. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea what I was in for when I was wearing that top hat. <laughs> Whose idea was it then that, okay, we've got all these gorgeous boys, oh, and a lovely little girl, mm -hmm. Marie, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to go into show business and, and do this. I think it just happened by default in a way. It wasn't a grand design. Um, the way I understand it, because I wasn't a part of the, the band at the, at the beginning, the four brothers would, would perform at parties and, and church functions and things like that. Donny was still a toddler when he joined his brothers for rehearsals in a garage that his father, George, had turned into a studio. And George was as disciplined there as he was in the home. I hated that rehearsal studio we had because the amount of uh, the time in there, it seemed like I lived in that, that room. And that's where we learned to sing and harmonize and dance and, and become the Osmond brothers. Who taught you? My father's philosophy was surround yourself with the best you can possibly find and you become the best. But we didn't really have the resources or the wherewithal to hire all these professionals to teach every one of us. So one of us would go out and learn an instrument and come back and teach the rest of us. <laughs> That's the way we did it. I'm Alan. I'm Wayne. I'm Meryl. I'm Jay. I'm six years old. It was Donnie's four older brothers who got the first big break into show business on a weekly television variety show hosted by star crooner Andy Williams. Osmond Brothers Quartet, we love to sing you bet. So hello to everyone. Hi there. And that's where it all began. And Andy said, do you have anybody else at home? He says, well, we have a brother named Donnie. You mean you have a brother? Yes, sir. Well, where is he? Is he here? Yes, sir. I was sitting with my father. He said, OK, now go down there and sit on Andy's knee. And I had no idea how many people were watching. What is your name? Donnie. Donnie? Yes, sir. Well, how old are you? Five. And I came on and sang, and as they say, the rest is history. Yes, sir, she's the neatest, and also the sweetest. Yes, sir, that's my baby, now. I don't mean maybe. Yes, sir, that's my baby, now. Oh, do you know? Yes, sir, that's my baby, now. It was that very moment right there that I gotta do this the rest of my life. But while Donnie was honing his professional skills in the television studio and touring with his brothers, he was missing out on a formal education. Being home tutored, homeschooled by your mother, or did you have other tutors that came in? All of the above. Yeah. You know, I, I went to um, a couple weeks of the second grade a couple weeks of the sixth grade and one semester of college and that's all I did. 
when you did have those brief moments in school, real school, it, it must have been hard to suddenly find yourself with other kids. Boy, you're so perceptive. Well, not really. But no, I'd... you really are. <laughs> because I recall moments in my mind, just as you were saying this, Liggett Street School, I can't believe I remember that name. That was the second grade. And I felt like a fish out of water. Mm. I was in this big room with all these other kids and we're sitting at desks and there's a blackboard and the teacher's writing stuff on this like, what's this all about? I, I remember for, I was late for school because I didn't know where I was supposed to be and I got penalized. What happened? I, I had to sit down on the bench for recess because I, I didn't know what I was doing. And, and looking back, it was, it's, it's kind of comical, but I thought, how cruel to do that to a kid who's, who's never been to school. And I think I even started crying. I was like, what did I do wrong? Mm. Did you have friends uh, outside the family, outside the church even? At that time in my life, no. Mm. No, I never really did because we were always like traveling or I was at a television studio. My friends were adults. You know, I, my friends were like people like Bob Hope and, and uh, Bing Crosby and Andy Williams and, and Lucille Ball. Those were my friends. You were on the adult schedule from age five, age six. Five. Yeah. That's why I loved living vicariously through my children as I raised them. Because I just, I wanted them to have such a normal lifestyle because I didn't, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that process. And my youngest now is, is 16. And so now I'm living vicariously through my grandkids. Wow. Yeah. Grandchildren. Seventh on the way. Towards the end of the 1960s, the Osmonds began to reach out to a younger audience. They left The Andy Williams Show in 1969. But it was two years before they hit the jackpot with a number originally intended for the Jackson 5. Well, One Bad Apple was just... It, it, well, that was a turning point for you all, wasn't it? It was. We were at number three. Yeah. And I was listening to a radio show called the Casey Kasem American Top 40 Countdown. Yeah. Hi, my name is Casey Kasem and this is American Top 40. And it was on a Sunday. Yeah. And we were all sitting around the radio and the show started and my dad walks in the room and says, shut the radio off. I said, what? He said, shut it off. It's Sunday, we're gonna to go to church. I said, we can't go to church today. This is, this is the countdown, and last week we were at number three. And my dad says, I don't care. <laughs> it's Sunday morning, we're gonna to go to church, get ready. So we shut the radio off. This is American Top 40, where every week we count. We were off to church and we're dying. So we ran home as fast as we could after it was over, turned the radio on, just as Casey announced the number three record. And it wasn't us. Oh. We're up to number three in American Top 40. It's Lynn Anderson and Rose Garden. I beg your pardon. And then he announced the number two record, and it wasn't oh, us. So you thought... I thought, when we, we dropped from three when we were at church. Yes. And then when he said, and the number one record all across the U.S. With the new number one song in the U.S.A., here are the Osmonds. Yeah. It's the Osmonds. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. <laughs> and we just started screaming. We just thought, no, this can't be. We couldn't have jumped from three to one, but we did. It moved them into another era of recording, not just being Andy Williams' background singers or the cute little Osmond boys. The Osmonds were now pop stars, and at their first concert, they got a taste of what that might mean. I remember the lights went out and we entered stage and I'll never forget my initial reaction. I ran out on stage and heard all this screaming and I thought, somebody's hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody call, call a medic. There's screaming people out there. And then I realized, they're screaming for us. <laughs> I just thought, wow, this is crazy. These are my brothers. Really, guys? No. <laughs> The Osmonds were a hit with fans in America. But the reaction on this side of the Atlantic was so huge it led to a new word, Osmond mania. Its peak was 1973, 
but when the Osmonds arrived at Heathrow, the fans' enthusiastic welcome triggered something that made headlines for all the wrong reasons. When we went over to England, it was, it was really crazy. Tony Prince and I were sitting in a cubicle on the Queen's building. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is your royal ruler, Tony Prince. Keep real cool, and in about 25 minutes from now, if the flight comes in on time, the boys will be waving at you all and blowing your kisses, all right? Well, good luck. Good luck. We were all standing there at the airplane, you know, and waving, and then all the balconies were full of the girls. The coping stones went on a wall, and it just fell down. <gasps> and it took my breath away. And I said, look, I saw the girls fall. It just went chaotic. What's wrong? <laughs> it was just the pressure of the whole crowd. They just seemed to run up against the barrier. I just heard it crash. I just leapt forward and pulled them all out of the way. It was falling down. The, the, the thing, I felt it go forward and then it went and all everything was down. It fell and all these people, it just fell off the way forward. The wall was coming away, lots of it were falling. So we got quite on. No one got hurt. Well, so far, I don't think so, but... Uh... Thankfully, nobody was seriously hurt. There were various newspapers there that took pictures, but it was exaggerated. Tony and I carried on singing. There's nothing else you could do, really. Hello. David Hughes was the Osmonds press officer. That really was the incident that set the whole thing off. So everything they did, the national press wanted to know about. And so then it became almost unstoppable. Right now, a Top of the Pops exclusive. You can now see it, you can now hear for the first time the new Osmonds single. And they were choreographed to the nth degree. And they had fabulous outfits. They worked their butts off. They were really, really sharp. And we'd never seen anything so professional, so glossy, compared to our kind of shambolic lot. I was the teeny bop DJ in those days. And uh, I started touring with them. Tony Prince! Now, I'd worked with the Beatles way back. This was just the same. It was just crazy, crazy, crazy. Exciting, exciting, exciting. The first concert on the 1973 tour was the Bellevue Stadium, Manchester. Have you got a ticket to see? Yeah. How much did that cost? You? Two pounds. Can you afford that? Yeah. Can afford anything for Danny. I'm getting on that stage, I just thought I'd tell you. So talk us through that. You arrive in a stadium, you're all on stage before the crowd come in, setting up, you're all plugging in your um, keyboard and mm -hmm. sort of going, what, what do I do with this? <laughs> Sticking it all in. <laughs> getting ready, what's the routine of getting ready? Do you have a, a group hug, prayer? Anything? Yeah, we use, you know, prayer before, but yeah. we go on. And, you know, just before I went on, I remember the butterflies. You know, the butterflies would come thinking, okay, I know what's about to happen here. And uh, we'd go out in the dark. And I would just wait for those spotlights to hit us because yeah, the screaming was going on like crazy. They weren't ready for this. They just didn't know what was hitting them. And I remember Alan going, one, two, one, two, three, four. And the lights hit. And I was playing the keyboard. And I looked out in the audience and people were crying and pulling their hair. And Bedlam. Hysteria. It just got out of hand, you know, the security couldn't handle it. It was chaos. These are five nice boys with a nice mum and dad. What is going on? Girls were fainting. 
trying to get on stage. We had to stop the show. You know, we've got to move back, or else we hit, we're going to stop, okay? Please, everybody move back. Can everyone please move back? Please move back. Everyone I had to, you know, appeal to them. Come on now, calm down. It's time to calm down. The ones who are standing up at the front who think they love the Osmonds. You can't love them if you stand up. If you love the Osmonds, go back to your seats or else there won't be a show. Do you love the Osmonds? Well, go and find a seat. And yeah, they did calm down. They knew there was not going to be a show if they didn't. And on we went. This was the man responsible for it all. You realise that? He's to blame for everything. Yeah, because he blame our thing. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is awesome. <laughs> you this loved just, it. Oh, I loved every second of it. Getting in the car trying to escape after a concert with Donnie sweating, you know, they hadn't even got time to change. Straight out the back door, into the limo, into the van, and out you went. The Osmonds were all teen idols, but it soon became apparent that one of them was getting most of the attention. The big focus was Donnie, you know, he was the heartthrob, he was the one that everybody was really screaming for. He was the one that everybody wanted to marry, of course. How did your brothers react to you suddenly, obviously emerging as the well, boy? They were getting screamed for. Thank you, thank you. But oh, yeah. You moved forward, yeah. no one could hear. Hi, I'm Donnie Osmond. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting because I was a very shy kid growing up. so. I, it was a juxtaposition of this ego wanting to tease the girls, because I was loving it. I just love these British girls. I, I mean, one day, you never know, I might marry one and take her back home. And this shy kid saying, no, I just want to be part of the band. And it was, it was kind of a dichotomy for me, because I had both emotions going on at the same time. I thought it must have been difficult, it must have been hard for the other brothers, must be really tough for them to see him out front. Two, take one. Now, are you a very close family, or do you ever fall out with each other? Well, we hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're very, very close. close. You bet. We're Together. Close. We're, we're very close. close. I wasn't a part of the original band. Mm. Jay had all of the uh, attention. Yes, because he was the baby too. He you was the baby, off. yeah. He was the one getting all the attention in the Andy Williams show. And then I come and steal his thunder. He and I have had some really interesting conversations about this. Yeah? Yeah, it was, it was very hard on him. Very hard on him because he had to back out of the uh, spotlight. And uh, it was hard on Merrill because Merrill was, was the rock and roller. He was our singer. He had a great rock and roll voice. Yeah. And uh, it was my teeny bopper career that kind of squashed all that. It, it, it was very uncomfortable. You know what we haven't talked about is puppy love. I've heard of that song. Oh, I guess they'll never know. Roger Holt was the Osmonds record promoter. I saw in rehearsals Donnie singing Puppy Love. And I thought, God, that's amazing. Went, and I was with a journalist who went, ooh, that's awful, Roger. I released it and it was number one for five weeks. That song was a turning point for you, wasn't it? Yeah. In a good way or a bad way? It was a good way. I mean, who in their right mind wouldn't want to live my shoes during the puppy love days? Come on. Osman Mania had become Donny Mania. His face now adorned every teen magazine with plenty of merchandise to satisfy the most ardent follower. Donny was an absolute gift to a teenage magazine in terms of circulation because um, once we started doing the double page um, centre pinups and then over three weeks um, the magazine sales took off from 600,000 to uh, over a million in under nine months. When the Osmonds World magazine was launched Tina McKenzie was its very first fan of the month. I just liked the Osmonds since I was about 11, 12. Uh, Puppy Love came out um, and then I uh, thought that was absolutely brilliant, so I started uh, following them and every movement they made. And I had posters all over the walls. Well, my husband thinks I'm totally mad. <laughs> 
For the fan club, it was a struggle to cope with the demands of the fans. We had 168,000 members, which was equivalent to the Beatles. Oh, look at all this mail. I had an opening department, I had a dispatch department, I had a newsletter department, and a merchandising department. I couldn't get out my front door for sacks of mail. You get loads of cakes sent to you, you know, and when they arrive, they're all a mess, all squashed up. Ooh, darling, what's that? Well, it was a lemon meringue pie. The funniest one was when that girl put herself in a box and posted herself to us. Oh, come on. Can you imagine somebody doing that? So there you are, young teenager, teen magazines, you're on the front cover of everything. Oh, what's Donnie's favourite colour? Purple. Everything purple in the world was sent to Donnie. My bedroom had purple walls. Uh, what's Donnie's favourite food? Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> they did drink 7-Up. I used to collect some cans <laughs> and store them in my bedroom. <laughs> this was happening yeah. on an hourly basis. All the time. I mean, we used to churn out so much stuff about them. It was, it was you know, anything we could get our hands on. As the appetite for all things Osmond reached frenzy point, the British establishment began to sit up and take notice. The BBC even televised a debate on the subject of pop hysteria. Good evening. On Tuesday this week, I think I heard what must have been the loudest noise I've ever heard in my life. Just listen to it for a moment. Well, that was the sound of thousands of 8 to 15-year-old girls welcoming their heroes, the Osmonds. I think it's frightening, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, I wouldn't let my little girl go. Two young girls actually fell on the pavement and had to be revived by smelling sauce. Now, this is wrong. We've got the um, Osmond fan club secretary you are, aren't you? What do you say to that, to that sort of argument, that it is dangerous? Men do it every week. Saturday afternoons, they all go and watch football matches. Yeah. Do you remember watching that debate? I remember that debate. Did it make you laugh or were you worried? I was having the time of my life. I thought, they're debating, am I really healthy? to be in the UK because of what I'm doing to these young girls. And I'm thinking, this is so cool. <laughs> you know, but then I was kind of confused. I said, well, I'm just getting up there and singing. You know, I'm just doing my thing. And I'll never forget my brother Alan turned to me. He says, don't ever forget this moment. And I never have. of course was it actually you were harmless you couldn't meet any of these girls could you i did these were the girls that you'd pulled out of the audience mm -hmm. what did you we, do we'd go backstage and i'd get a picture with them and that's all that happened <laughs> i was a good little mormon boy you were a good boy. yeah i was a good little mormon boy and uh i would look at all these pictures and, and dream think oh they could be my girlfriends I'm not being a good little Mormon boy meant celibacy before marriage and following rules laid down by his devout father. So Donnie doesn't no, date yet? The boys don't date till they're 16. I'm 16 now and I'm dating girls! Yes. When you did go on a date though, what would be a typical date with you? Oh, just any typical date, you know. That was just a normal kid. Cinema, oh, ice yeah. cream parlor. Oh, sure, I go out to dinner movie, you know, and we would just make out. Well, well, hang on. Okay, you need to translate for me. Making out yeah. is, is... Kissing. Just kissing. Just okay. kissing. But we didn't go any further than that. Mm -hmm. Donnie's behavior was governed at all times by his faith. Mormonism was very much part of the Osmonds' image. I think a lot of the fans thought it was something that kept the family together and they looked upon it as being something that was really lovely. Many, many children have joined the church and brought their whole families in since we've been in the show business and it just thrills us to death. Whatever your view of their religion, you could not fault their positive attitude to life and to everything. That's a good role model to look at. But not everyone thought Mormonism was good for business. 
I tried to keep religion out of it. Uh, not that I was against religion, but I just felt it was better to keep it out. There was the feeling if there was a kind of religious slant to it, it would be a turn-off. For Donny, the focus on his faith raised questions in his own mind. They were always interested in, you're a Mormon, you're a Mormon, what do they believe, and all this kind of stuff. And, and I would say, yes, I believe it, you know. I had no idea what I believed. So I said, yeah, I believe the Bible, and uh, never read it. See, I believe the Book of Mormon is, a, is an, uh, as another witness of Jesus Christ. I never read it. You know, I, I dabbled into it. And I remember thinking at 16 years old, I remember looking at myself in, my, in the mirror. I said, you are such a hypocrite. Did you? You have no idea what you're talking about. So I said, you better start now to find out who you are. And so I started reading the Bible, the Book of Mormon, praying, doubting, questioning. I said, here's a question, what's the answer? And I started just delving into it. That was a great gift my parents gave us, is to really make our own choices. My mother, she wasn't a Mormon because her parents were. And she would always say, go find your answers because you can't live off my faith. You have to have your own. I have a very, very strong testimony of my faith because I put it to the test. And I believe in prayer. I believe there's a God. I believe I am his child. I believe there's a plan in life. And that we're not just, we just didn't happen to be here. We have a, a loving Heavenly Father who is, watches over us. I believe that mm. with all my heart. While Donny was examining his own beliefs, brother Alan was writing tracks for a new Osmonds album which asked all those big questions. It seems that there's a lot of confusion nowadays among especially the youth. They're asking themselves these questions like, well, why am I here? I mean, where did I come from? What am I doing here? Where am I What's going to happen when I die someday? Well, this was our plan album. We just released the plan. And that was our attempt to answer those questions because we feel that we do have the answers. The plan was released in 1973 at the peak of the Osmonds' popularity. It was an ambitious concept album. It's gotta be the last day. Which combined rock and roll with Mormonism. Gotta be the last day. But it was also the biggest commercial risk of their career with tracks that were not what their teenage fans had come to expect. Billions, caught up in revolutions. I love that album. That was the direction the Osmonds were headed towards. Crazy Horses, The Plan, <clears throat> Progressive Rock, as we call it. My brother Alan went to a radio station in Los Angeles as Alan from a new band. <laughs> and he sat down with the program director, the music director, and they started playing this. Is wow, this is fantastic. Sounds like Led Zeppelin, The Who, uh, all this kind of stuff. We'd really love to play this. And so what did you say the name of the band is? He says, actually, it's the Osmond Brothers. And they said, I'm sorry, we can't play it. Because? Image. Image. It was Donny Osmond's, you know, puppy love image. It was the teeny bopper thing that, that was so huge. Everybody's loving you and they're screaming, but the rock and rollers, the, the press, the, the people in the know are saying, you're garbage. For instance, Rolling Stone magazine wrote, quote, the worst day in rock and roll history was the day Donny Osmond was born. Yeah. It kind of squashed where we were going as a band. That's what they say. The plan exposed the ever-widening gulf between Donny's image and the Osmonds' musical ambitions. But the family machine was about to work its magic again. In 1973, Marie Osmond emerged from the shadows with her first single, Paper Roses, which reached number two in the UK charts. At the same time, Donny and Marie stepped into the spotlight together. And you and I are just like they. Even as children, they'd been as thick as thieves. Oh my goodness, Donny got me in trouble all the time. You know, I was the little sister that wanted to, hey, let's just be with the big brother. <laughs> We did all kinds of crazy things. We would just spend all day having these little adventures, and that's when we took all of our mother's jewelry. We were going to be pirates. And we buried it 
in the backyard. And then we forgot about it until the next day. And all of a sudden we heard my mother go, ah! And we're like, what's the matter? Where's all my jewelry? I've been robbed. And Dottie and I looked at each other like, oh my gosh, we're dead. <laughs> and I couldn't remember where I buried it. Did you ever find it? Yes, we had the entire family out in the backyard with shovels. I think it was so, I got in so much trouble. We found it, but our brothers were not very happy with us. <laughs> In 1975, Donnie and Marie capitalized on their sibling chemistry. Aged 18 and 16, they became the youngest hosts of a primetime television show, which, in keeping with the Osmond ethos, was wholesome and family orientated. And the Donnie and Marie show was just like massive, and so the budget was like, you know, nobody's heard of these kinds of budgets for a variety show. And, and ABC, where they were just spending money right and left. And so we had this mentality, bigger, the better. And I, I think, Fern, it was, it was a good thing. I couldn't say no. No, I don't want to do this massive television show. I don't want to be a big television star. Who's going to say that? The Donnie and Marie show was very much a family enterprise. With Donnie and Marie out front and three of the brothers producing. But behind the scenes, there were tensions building. Everything that now you and Marie are earning, does that all go into one pot for all of you to share out equally? So. You want to open that Pandora's wow. box? Okay, do it. Is that what happens? So, so everyone can have a bit of a, whew, a break. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness, Donnie and Marie are out there earning some money now. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it was. And it, it, yeah, I don't think it was fair, because we were just like working our butts off. Donnie and Marie shows, we had to memorize 250-ish pages of script in two and a half days. And then, on top of that, we had all of our schooling to do. You know, I can kind of sugarcoat this a little bit and say, you know, everybody worked so hard. We couldn't have done it without them. Yeah. We couldn't. But it was, the wealth was spread so far that we really didn't enjoy the spoils of the, of the work that we did. Mm. And it all would have been fine had we not lost everything. Oh. Because in 1980, we almost had to take out bankruptcy. What happened there? Well, you know, I, this, you talk to 100 people, you get 100 different opinions. Here's mine. Um, right from the get-go, we did everything on a grandiose basis. May tomorrow be if you're going to do something, go all the way. If you're going to put on a show, put on a big show. The Osmonds were financially out of their depth. In 1979, the Donnie and Marie show was cancelled when ratings fell. The following year, the Osmond enterprise collapsed with a personal loss for Donnie of $30 million. But there was another reason for the decline in Donnie's popularity. The teen idol broke his teeny bopper's hearts. Let's talk about Debbie. Debbie Glynn, you were, oh, I don't know how old you were, 18, 19 when you met her, something like that? I was actually 16 when I met her. Oh, were you? Mm hmm Where did you meet her, in the church? No, she was dating my brother. <laughs> Jay? Jay. So you nicked his job in the band and you nicked his girlfriend? Bada bing. <laughs> actually, Debbie Glenn was like the, the really hot cheerleader uh, in town. And so Jay started dating her. We double dated, and uh, we went to Elton John's concert, it was 1975, and he sat down and started singing your song, and something happened within me. That song just resonated, and I looked over, and I remember saying to myself, someday, I'm going to marry my brother's date. I asked her out, and she turned me down. Now, now, now wear my shoes here for a second, I, I don't want to sound pompous or egotistical or anything, but I'm, I'm like one of the top teen idols of the world. <laughs> and yes! I could pick up a say it. I could pick up a phone and say, you want to go out with me? I'm Donnie Osmond. And yeah, yeah. And I call Debbie Glenn and she says, no. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> you know, and she says, no, I'm busy tonight. I says, well, okay, circumstantial. What about next week? She says, no, I'm still, I'm, I'm busy that week too. She kept turning me down, so the chase was on. 
And that's what my single is about. Could she be mine? That, that's what my, my single is about. It's about Debbie. Could she be mine? Oh. I was about 18 and a half, close to 19, before she finally realized, <laughs> okay, yep, I better marry this man. <laughs> The wedding in 1978 involved a traditional Mormon ceremony, promising union even beyond death. You and Debbie, of course, were married again in the temple. Yes. Uh, sealed, yes. celestially. Yes. Uh, would you, um, she was already of the faith. Yes. Um, would you have considered marrying her if she wasn't part of your church, if she was uh, outside the church? I think so. I mean, I'm so in love with her. But uh, I would have foregone those, those wonderful blessings that I hold so dear. Are they different to the sort of vows that we would well, say? Well, yeah, it's not till death do you part. Uh, it's just the, uh, the blessings of, of eternity, mm. of, uh, that we could uh, be together forever. Donny Osmond, the teen idol, was 20, and his marriage sent shockwaves around the world. People were sending their cards back and he's broken my heart, he was supposed to be marrying me. While Donny's attention had been on his new bride and his television career, he hadn't been making hit records. And now, tastes were changing. And then the punk era came. So everybody was on to the next thing. I got married and then you, you know, you start your family life and everything and um, it all went pretty quiet then. Everything just kind of went to a screeching halt and it was very hard on him. It was really hard on him. I stopped the fan club 1979-1980 because basically it wasn't really worth doing it anymore. It, it just went down. Please welcome our press conference guest this morning, singer and songwriter Donny Osmond. In the 1980s, Donny couldn't sell records or escape his teeny bopper past. How do you feel now that um, not as famous as you were in the 70s? Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, I prefer it this way because in the 70s it was, qu it was quite hyped. You know, it was just screaming and hysteria and things like that. Granted, I enjoyed it, like I said before, but now it's, it's much more into the music, making the music uh, and, and being a serious entertainer and writer. His attempts to reinvent himself failed time and time again. So cool. Zoe, I know that you hate talking about your past. Why do you hate talking about Why it? Why are you bringing it up then? <laughs> no, come on. Why do you hate talking because about it? Because my past has no relevance to what I'm doing right now. That's the main reason. But you are where you are, aren't you, because of what you've done. Fine. So are you. But we don't talk about your past. Now then, you were a huge success at the age of 14. In sporting terms, perhaps you peaked a little early, do you think? I don't think so. There were times where I, I felt like, you know, back off, leave him alone. Times got really hard, and I depended upon the discipline that my dad taught me. It, it is going to be difficult to establish a complete new career, don't you think? It's going to be difficult? Mm. I don't think so. Everybody was so negative towards him, but he kept believing in himself. You have to just get your job done. No matter what you feel like, there were moments, Fern, when I was sick as a dog. Don't, don't look at the face, you know, listen to the music and, and get over that stigma because uh, it, it will take time to get over that stigma. I understand that, I realize yeah. it. You gotta turn the other cheek sometimes mm -hmm. because you reap what you sow. You gotta be kind out there Ed, and because it, it will return to you eventually. Uh, and that's the philosophy that I've learned over the years. I read somewhere that when you were signed to Virgin um, to make a record, mm -hmm. uh, session men and, and people were laughing because it was Donny Osmond. Give me their names, I'll eliminate them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that presumably Okay, is... I'll be honest. If I was on the other side, I would probably laugh too. Mm. You couldn't get a recording contract, it had no, gone. No, I would do anything, Fern, to just be heard because I believed in my talent. Fern, I was doing demos. And what does that mean? Uh, it, it was like I was recording the track so somebody else could record it. Oh. So a writer would write it and says, I need a singer. Says, Let me sing. And I'd do it all for free. You know, just, like a session singer. I was a session singer. 
So I would record these songs for other, other people, for other artists, and they would copy me lick for lick. Donny turned to an old friend for advice. And I think even Michael Jackson, you were driving in the car with him, and you said to him, I, I want to get this back together, and he said to you... I'll never forget it. We were headed to A&M Records, and uh, he played me Thriller on a cassette. He said, Donnie, I want to play you my next album. And he played me some of Thriller, and I said, this is going to be huge, Mike. This is going to be fantastic. How do I get back on on the charts? And he said, you got to change your name. Your name is Poison. Quote. <laughs> Inside, yeah. I was dying. I said, you got to be kidding me. I've worked these many years to establish my name, and it's Poison. He said, yeah. He was a smart man. I miss him. He said to me one time, Donna, you're the only person on this planet that really knows what I went through as a kid. And I'm the only person that knows what you went through. Because our lives were so similar. When you between the After ten years of failure and rejection, and on the verge of giving up hope, Donny finally got the break he needed in 1989. As a gimmick, an influential New York radio station ran a mystery artist promotion of his new song, Soldier of Love, followed by an on-air reveal. The song was a hit record and I was a mystery artist. I was happy to see him have success again. And I knew he would. I knew he would because we were raised to never give up. For I know... I build that, I build that right there. For I know I shall die. Donnie's name was back in lights, and in 1992, he took to the stage in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I closed my eyes. For the next six years, the show toured North America to sell out audiences. To see for certain. But the pressure of performing night after night began to take its toll. I thought it was just like, you know, Everybody goes through this, stage fright, everybody gets a little weak need. All right, that's just what I'm going through. I didn't know it was social anxiety disorder. But at the time, you were using your entertainer, Donny Osmond, discipline, mm -hmm. not to show it to anybody. Oh, no, I hit it. I hit it well. Yeah. But I was dying inside. Close every door to me. Fern, I, okay, there were times that I had such panic attacks that I knew, in my mind, I know it's unrealistic, but you know in your mind, if I'm going to walk on stage, I'm going to die. Literally die. Really? I mean, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse, till in 1995, it climaxed, and I couldn't go on stage. <laughs> And I think the thing that brought it to its climax was the fact that I lost my career and I had to rebuild right from the beginning. Um, and I am now doing a show where there's standing room only. And it is so successful that you can't get a ticket. Yeah. Now I, I have to be perfect. And I'll never forget, Fern, it was in Minneapolis and they called half hour and I started shaking and they called 15 minutes and I have to start getting dressed five minutes of showtime I'm sweating and perspiring I just I'm shake literally shaking and my wife turns to me and grabs me and she gives me the best advice anybody ever gave me she said why don't you do yourself a favor and why don't you do that audience a favor why don't you go out there tonight and just be average do an average show tonight. She gave me license to make a mistake. She gave me license to just, you know, be myself. Fern, it was the best show I ever did in my life. I let the perfectionism go. Mm. And that was the beginning stages of getting rid of this disorder that I had. Once they figured out what it was, I think it was very helpful for him. And it's not uncommon. A lot of people have them. And it, especially in this business where everything is pressure and we had so much pressure on us as children. One take Osmonds. We had to do everything one take. 
That is so much pressure. So when I get on stage now, if those pangs ever come back to me, I realize, no, these are games that are being played in my mind from times past. In all of that, did you ever feel that God had left you? Sometimes I questioned it. Yeah. But through it all, I've learned something very, very important. Sometimes God allows us to go through trials because we can't know the sweet until we know the bitter. Mm. We can't know the good unless we've seen the bad. I think a lot of people can resonate with that. Yeah. Don't leave me. This year, Donnie celebrates 50 years as an entertainer and he shows no signs of stopping. He loves what he does. I can't ever see Donnie retiring. He was just a magic mix of uh, a beautiful boy and good music. Very talented and incredibly professional. He just makes me just go really funny. <laughs> he used to be my little kid, but he's no longer. Um, He's good looking, he's respectful, and he's just smashing the bloke, and I love him to bits. He's very tender. Donnie's a very tender heart. Um, I guess it's okay I tell you that. <laughs> He'll go, really? I've sort of seen him at various stages, and the most heartwarming thing is that he is the same person. He is that same bright, warm, charismatic, funny, uh, professional person. There's no side to him at all, and I, I really like him for that. How has the strength of your belief altered in the last 50 years? What I've learned over the years, it's, it's all about loving each other. Yeah. You know, love God, love your fellow man, felt your, your, your neighbor, you know, whoever you come into, love them. And where will you spend Christmas Day then? You go to church? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I'm going to be in New York with my family. In New York? We're going on a Christmas tour, but obviously Christmas Day is off. And so we're just going to uh, do the fun things and shopping and Christmas uh, uh, in New York. Have a New York Christmas. What's your favorite Christmas song? Doesn't have to be your own. It's the most wonderful time of the year. You know why? Why? Andy Williams. That's Andy Williams' song. And every time I hear that song on the radio, every Christmas they play it like crazy. It just takes me back to my childhood, to those wonderful days of working with my brothers. Not the bad times, but, uh, but just working with Alan, Wayne, Merrill, and Jay. And skating and singing, and it's, it's Christmas to me. Well, his childhood may have been denied him by a father who thought he was doing the right thing, and Donny Osmond's parents certainly loved him. And if they needed forgiveness, I think Donny has forgiven them. But he's also a man who has known the heights of success and the depths of despair, and he's faced them both with tremendous honesty and managed to hang on to his faith. I think Donny Osmond has earned his place back in the sun. You are